Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast. This episode is episode three of my review of congenital cardiac malformations for the ABR core exam. If you haven't yet heard episodes one and two, that's okay. These episodes are not in any particular order. I recently received some excellent feedback in terms of an addition I could have made to a question I asked on the prior episode. That question was about Epstein anomaly. In the answer, I stated that box-shaped heart is one classic descriptor for the radiographic appearance of Epstein anomaly, and that box-shaped heart is very similar to heart-shaped box from the great 90s band Nirvana. This astute listener very accurately pointed out that I missed the opportunity to not only speak about box-shaped heart, which is similar to heart-shaped box, but also maternal lithium exposure, wherein lithium was one of the names of one of the hit songs from Nirvana as well. So Epstein's anomaly is certainly the Nirvana lesion with both a box-shaped heart and maternal lithium exposure. And thank you very much for that feedback, and hopefully that can help us all remember some of these classic associations with Epstein's anomaly. A free downloadable study guide covering questions and answers from episodes 1, 2, and 3 on congenital cardiac anomalies is now available on my website, theradiologyreview.com, for free download, so go ahead and check that out if that is helpful for you. Without further ado, let's get into the questions and answers for this episode. First question, patent ductus arteriosus involves a patent connection between which structures? Patent ductus arteriosus involves patency of the duct between the aorta and the pulmonary arterial system. Next. Within what time frame does the ductus arteriosus normally close? The answer here is that within approximately 24 to 48 hours after birth, the ductus arteriosus will functionally close. Anatomic full closure can take about a month. Next question. Why can a patent ductus arteriosus potentially be life-saving with certain congenital cardiac anomalies. In certain congenital cardiac anomalies, maintaining persistence of the ductus arteriosus can be key for survival and well-being of the infant, as this allows blood to flow between the aorta and pulmonary arterial system in a separate way, So if the normal flow between the aorta and pulmonary system is disrupted, this in a way acts as a backup mechanism. For example, in cases of tetralogy of Fallot, pulmonary atresia, hypoplastic left heart, this aberrant blood flow through the patent ductus arteriosus can be beneficial. Functional closure may be delayed or else therapy may be given to prevent the functional and anatomic full closure of the ductus arteriosus. That leads us to the next question. What types of treatments can be considered to close a patent ductus arteriosus? Treatments to close a patent ductus arteriosus include endovascular coiling, surgical clipping or ligation, or medical therapy. Next, what medical therapy exists to help keep the ductus arteriosus open, and what medical therapy exists to help close the ductus arteriosus? To help keep the ductus arteriosus, I would remember the classic therapy with prostaglandin E1. 
again, prostaglandin E1, can help maintain patency of the patent ductus arteriosus. On the other hand, to help close the ductus arteriosus, indomethacin can be used. Again, that is indomethacin, and that can be used to help close the ductus arteriosus. Now, in terms of ductus arteriosus for board exams, keep in mind that there is an association with patent ductus arteriosus and prematurity, cyanotic heart disease, and maternal rubella. With patent ductus arteriosus, the imaging appearance can vary depending on the direction of blood flow through the ductus and the presence of coexisting cardiac abnormalities. However, in an uncomplicated case, imaging may show cardiomegaly with left heart enlargement, AP window obscuration, and pulmonary edema. Next, for an atrial septal defect, is the ostium primum or ostium secundum type the most common? I believe I have covered this question in some way on prior podcast episodes, but let's go through it again. With an atrial septal defect, the secundum type of atrial septal defect is the most common. So remember, with atrial septal defects, Secundum is number one, not number two, as the name would suggest. Next, true or false? Secundum atrial septal defects often do not close on their own. The answer here is false. Secundum atrial septal defects often do close on their own, Primum atrial septal defects are less likely to close on their own and can also be difficult to close with device closure as they are often close to the atrioventricular valvular tissue. Some key associations with atrial septal defects include ostium primum atrial septal defect with Down syndrome and sinus venosus atrial septal defect with partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. Next, the egg on a string appearance on a frontal chest radiograph is classic for which entity? The answer I am looking for is that the egg on a string appearance on a frontal chest radiograph is classic for transposition of the great arteries and more specifically, Classic for the D type, D like dog, D type of transposition of the great arteries. Transposition of the great arteries is the top cause of cyanosis in the early neonatal period and is often associated with closure of the patent ductus arteriosus and or patent foramenal valley, which close 24 to 48 hours after birth and when open, help provide blood flow between the pulmonary and aortic circulation. So once the patent ductus arteriosus or patent foramen ovale closes, the cyanosis from the underlying transposition of the great arteries becomes manifest, and again, this is the top cause of cyanosis in the early neonatal period. Risk factors for transposition include maternal diabetes, The D type of transposition of the great arteries requires surgery to correct. On the other hand, the L type of transposition of the great arteries often does not require surgery, but is considered to be, quote, congenitally corrected, end quote. And if you are not familiar with the differences in the circulation patterns between D and L type transposition, that is probably something that is best studied visually, so go ahead and look that up. Next, on board exams, if you are shown a frontal radiograph of an infant that has cyanosis and a right aortic arch, what are the top two congenital cardiac anomalies you should first consider? The answers I am looking for are truncus arteriosus and tetralogy of Fallot. If there is increased pulmonary vascularity in an infant who has cyanosis and a right aortic arch, you would first suspect truncus arteriosus. On the other hand, 
if there is a history of cyanosis and imaging showing a right aortic arch and there is decreased pulmonary vascularity, you would then first expect tetralogy of Fallot. Next, we already covered the five T's of cyanotic congenital heart disease on the prior episode. What are the most common differential considerations for non-cyanotic congenital heart disease? Congenital heart disease without cyanosis should most commonly on board exams make you consider atrial and ventricular septal defects, patent ductus arteriosus, post-ductal aortic coarctation, and partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. Next question. True or false? Adrenal insufficiency can cause small heart size. The answer is true. Adrenal insufficiency, which is also termed Addison's disease, is a top differential consideration for a heart that is too small. Additional considerations for a heart that is too small can include malnourishment and other causes of cachexia, as well as constrictive pericarditis. Next question. Congestive heart failure in a newborn should make you think more about right-sided or left-sided cardiac obstruction. The answer is left heart obstruction, whether physically or functionally or both, is associated with newborn congestive heart failure. Think of entities like preductal aortic coarctation, mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, hypoplastic left heart, core triatriatum, and infracardiac total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Note that with total anomalous pulmonary venous return, having a large patent foramen ovale or atrial septal defect aids in survival. Supracardiac total anomalous pulmonary venous return is the most common subtype and gives the classic snowman appearance on a frontal chest radiograph as I also covered on the prior episode. Infracardiac pulmonary venous return is less common, but still shows up a lot on board exams and will show pulmonary edema in a newborn. Next, true or false? Total anomalous pulmonary venous return is associated with asplenia. The answer is true. In fact, nearly all cases of asplenia will have coexisting total anomalous pulmonary venous return. Asplenia is essentially bilateral right-sidedness, and the majority of these individuals will also have an endocardial cushion defect. Also remember the association between Down syndrome and endocardial cushion defects. Next, true or false? Truncus arteriosus essentially always has an associated ventricular septal defect. The answer is true. Truncus arteriosus is a cyanotic congenital anomaly wherein a common trunk provides both the systemic and pulmonary circulation instead of a separate pulmonary artery and proximal thoracic aorta. Truncus arteriosus is classically taught to always have an associated ventricular septal defect. Other high-yield associations with truncus arteriosus include de George syndrome, which is also sometimes called CATCH-22 syndrome, which is also 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. Truncus arteriosus is also classically associated with CHARGE syndrome and is also classically associated with a right aortic arch. For ABR core study, syndromes that are associated with cardiac anomalies tend to be high yield. And I have just mentioned two of these now. The first is DeGeorge or CATCH-22 syndrome, and the other is CHARGE syndrome. Let's go through both of those, because with DeGeorge syndrome, which is also 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, or CATCH-22 syndrome, 
The catch-22 is a mnemonic to help you remember the common associations. For C, that is cardiac anomalies, A, abnormal facies, T, thymic aplasia, C, cleft palate, H, hypocalcemia slash hypoparathyroidism, and 22 for 22Q11.2 deletion. Now let's move on to charge. First of all, charge is often associated or attributed to a CHD7 mutation, and this is an autosomal dominant disorder. The C stands for coloboma, which is an eye formation anomaly, H, heart defects, A, atresia coani, R, retarded growth and development, G, genital hypoplasia, and E, ear anomalies with possible deafness. If you want to review these in writing, make sure and check out the free downloadable study guide at theradiologyreview.com. Final question for this episode. True or false? Turner syndrome is associated with post-ductal aortic coarctation. The answer is false. Turner syndrome is associated with preductal aortic coarctation, which is sometimes also termed infantile aortic coarctation. The adult type of coarctation is postductal. In preductal coarctation, the patent ductus arteriosus becomes an important conduit for blood to flow from the pulmonary circulation into the more distal aorta. Note that Aortic coarctation in general is strongly associated with a bicuspid aortic valve and berry aneurysms, among other anomalies. Also, with aortic coarctation, look for rib notching of the 4th to 8th ribs, but not the 1st and 2nd ribs, as they have a separate blood supply from the costocervical trunk. That is a very high-yield fact for the ABR core exam. Also, the description for the appearance of the aorta on the frontal chest radiograph is the figure 3 sign. Go ahead and look that up if you do not know what that looks like. Turner syndrome is also highly tested on board exams. Other Turner associations include things like horseshoe kidney, gonadal dysgenesis, hypothyroidism due to thyroid antibodies, an antenatal detected cystic hygroma on ultrasound, and so forth. That concludes my three-part review of congenital cardiac anomalies, at least for now. Some things I have not covered in these episodes are surgical techniques to correct many of these congenital defects. I mention that because understanding these surgical repairs is important and, in my opinion, is best done visually, and you can find plenty of information on this in existing board preparation books and other online resources. You definitely should be comfortable with options and imaging appearances of surgical repair of entities like transposition of the great arteries and tetralogy of Fallot, among other cardiac anomalies. I will make a free downloadable study guide comprising questions and answers from episodes 1, 2, and 3 on congenital cardiac anomalies that you can download for free at theradiologyreview.com, so go ahead and check that out if that is helpful for you. Thank you for listening to this episode, and keep up the good work, and study hard. Remember, you have to study really hard to succeed on radiology board exams, so prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment. 